Um, yeah, hi, um, my name is Perry. Um, I am the last speaker of the day. Um, good news for you is I have a lot of energy. That's pretty good. And I drank some like cola and like uh, now I have even more energy. So I hope you have some energy too. There's a lot, there's a, they, oh, awesome, thank you. There's a, there's a lot that I want to talk about. I care about this a lot and you will see me care about it a lot. I also kind of tend to move around, just warning the camera that I do tend to kind of move. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Perry and I'm on a mission to make tech more accessible and more inclusive. So obviously there's two buzzwords in there, accessible we already heard a little bit about in terms of making websites, web projects more accessible, um, but inclusivity is something that we've been hearing about a little bit today as well. What I mean specifically is I'm trying to make tech more inclusive for women. I'm trying to make it more inclusive for people of color. I'm trying to make it more inclusive for people who are LGBTQ and also non-binary, trans. I want to make it more inclusive for people who are immigrants because I feel like there's a lot of a lack of awareness, especially in the United States, about how being an immigrant can affect your ability to work. And because I work mostly in the United States, um, I'm not going to rule out moving back to Europe. Um, I work with people, I try to encourage people whose, whose first language isn't English to participate in tech, and I try and remove the barriers for those folks. What I mean by accessible is I'm trying to make tech more easy for people to get into, to get jobs, to get working in, who don't have computer science degrees. That's what I care about. Regardless of what I do for money, um, these two things, making things more inclusive and making them more accessible, is always going to be what I care about and always going to be what, that's like my, my, the work of my heart. Um, I work for money, but I have also like, and I work for my brain and like my passion, but I also like, this is what I really, really care about. Um, while I was, as, as Helmut already mentioned, before I did the job that I do now, and I'm going to talk about that for just a second in a moment, is I was a teacher. So I went to a code school, and I also, as soon as I finished teaching there, was asked whether or not I wanted to come back and actually work at that code school uh, and teach, and so I did. And so I spent two and a half years teaching over 300 students how to code. And so some of them already knew a little bit of programming before they started, and some of them were literally, their first challenge was to figure out how to turn on the machine. Um, and we went from there to them being ready to being able to be hired, and I worked with over 300 of those folks for two and a half years. So I kind of saw a lot, and a lot of what I I care about and thinking about is informed by that. So as I mentioned, former teacher, I was also in charge of training and hiring teachers. I was in charge of uh, thinking about the curriculum. I was in charge of mentoring students and making sort of partnerships in my local community for a code school in Portland and uh, in Seattle as well called Epicodus. At the moment, um, I am a community manager. So um, specifically, that means that I am building a support community for the awesome company that is Netlify. Um, and of course, the logos are interestingly related. So also, we're hiring. Um, so if you're looking for a job and you're looking to do something that is a product that changes the way people build and deploy websites, if that sounds interesting to you, and you want to work with a remotely distributed team across the globe. We have people who work here in Germany. We have people who work, work all across Europe with us. Our headquarters are in San Francisco. And yes, you don't have to have a computer science degree to work with Netlify. So if that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and check out our, our careers page. So. You've probably already heard a lot today, depending on which track you are in, about why diversity is important. And I think, given the nature of this, of this conference, because of the fact that we have the tagline making a difference, I think that you all care about trying to make tech more diverse and more inclusive. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about why diversity is important, because I think I belong in the category that's over here on this side that I think it's just the right thing to do, and it is the hill that I will die on. It, is, it will be the thing that I will not, sh not shut up, and I won't stop talking about it forever, because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. I appreciate that. But there are also reasons why it's good for productivity and communication and all that stuff. It's the right thing to do. So you're wondering, how do these things connect? Like, what's the connection between talking about code schools and tech education and talking about diversity? And by the time you're done here, you will understand exactly how they're connected. 
But before we talk about how they're connected, I want to give you, just so that we're on the same page, I want to clarify the terminology just a little bit so that we can be on the same page. What I'm talking about when I'm talking about a code school is what you might know as a boot camp, as a coding boot camp. They are the same thing. Um, generally speaking, they are four to six months in length. Generally speaking, they are full time. Uh, some are not, but most are. Generally speaking, they are organized by companies, educational companies who run them for money. And generally speaking, they cost uh, quite a bit of money to attend. So the, my whole thesis and my whole theory is really mostly just about things that fit into this specific paradigm. And there's a couple of, couple of code schools up there that you could check out if you wanted to. So in order to kind of, before we launch into um, what my main thesis point, I want to give us a little bit of shared background. So you may already know this, but the way that code schools really came about is they're not really that old. Most of them started, the early ones began right around 2011, 2012. Hiring, needed, hiring was a big problem back in the day. It's kind of, it kind of still is, really, um, that there were not enough developers for the amount of jobs that were available, especially in the San Francisco and New York kind of tech hubs. And so people thought, well, Maybe what I can do is I can teach people how to code, and maybe that's how I can help people out. And so this, these small schools started coming out of nowhere, and they were training people. And in the beginning, this went really, really well. This worked out super well. People were actually getting jobs very quickly. It became kind of a boom industry. As we move into the, sort of the second stage of this modern code school area, we see this massive explosion of schools, because all of a sudden people are like, oh my goodness. We have something. Let's just make it huge. And they made it huge. So if you look at these numbers, you can see that in 2014, there were 43 code schools. But by 2016, it's already doubled and we have 91. And now we have over 100. There's like 110, roughly, right, about, right around that for 2018. They started, to, they started to stratify. So they started to pull apart. On one side, you have more affordable, um, maybe the curriculum isn't as great, and maybe the opportunities are not as great, and on the other, or maybe they're easier to get into. And on the other hand, you have schools that are really expensive, really hard to get into, but it, they're pretty much guaranteed that you're going to get a really top-notch job by the time that you're done. But you also start to see some problems that some, all of a sudden, some of the first code, code schools aren't really able to make it work financially, and some of them shut down. In Portland, where I live, there was one school that uh, was open one day, and then the next morning, the students came to class, and the doors were closed, and somebody had changed the locks. So all of their money was gone, all of their future was in doubt, and nobody had really knew what was going to happen. So in the, current, in the current era where we're at, we're sort of in the towards, we're moving into a different stage where, we're not, where the schools that are, that are in bigger cities are really struggling because of the fact that the market is pretty much saturated with people. So you have schools like Dev Bootcamp and the Iron Yard uh, that, that were, had good reputations and that were widely known are starting to close. Um, whereas there's schools in smaller cities that are still doing kind of okay. But we're also seeing the growth of like online code schools like Thinkful and like Treehouse, and they have a different they have a different structure in that you don't go to class every day, but that you're taking courses online, and so therefore they can they can structure themselves a little bit differently in terms of costs, which is why they're not facing the difficulty that other schools are, are facing. But if we're talking about code schools, aka boot camps. What are we talking about in terms of who are these students, how many of them are there, what, what is the size of this market? And, and I'm going to freely admit these numbers are not as in-depth as they could be, and they are, they are about just about the American market. I don't have any other numbers. If somebody has better numbers for me, I would, I would love to have you tweet me and tell me where I can find them so I can integrate them here. This is a number that is pretty impressive, I think. Especially if we're thinking about things like junior devs, imposter syndrome, um, learning on the job, things like that. That one third of developers have learned to code in the last five years. That's pretty impressive, I think. This number comes from the Stack Overflow developer survey. 
of people that are self-reporting. Of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a specific data set, but it's still interesting to think about that at least in that survey, one third of people indicated it's been less than five years that they have been actually writing code. I think it's pretty interesting. This number is starting to get kind of out of control, if you ask me, that in the US market, almost 37,000 people will graduate from a coding school slash boot camp in 2018. And we're almost in 2019. So this is just the numbers from this year. So there's still a little bit to go. It'll grow a little bit more. This doesn't take into account all of the people that have graduated in the, in the previous years. So the numbers are pretty staggering. And if you look at the bottom, there's some links about some, some resources that you can tap into to kind of look at that if you want to pull it apart um, to get more information about where my numbers are coming from. This next one is really going to blow your mind. $21 million is the size of the revenue by the coding, the coding boot camp industry in the United States alone per year. That's not, that's not profit. I don't have numbers about profit, but it is income. So that's the money that they are generating from students, full-time, part-time, online, offline. That's how much money, that's how big the size of this market is. And this is actually a number that I find even, maybe even more impressive, although I feel pretty, pretty blown away by this. This is the size increase of the coding boot camp industry between 2013 and 2018. Tell me another market where you see a 748% increase in five years. I don't know of one, maybe you do, but I don't know of one. I think that that's pretty impressive. So where we're starting to talk about diversity is when we look at the demographics who people, of people who make up the, the bulk of code school students. I knew this anecdotally from the students that I was working with, that many of them were in demographics that were not necessarily represented in, in computer science programs. But then I did some research and I found out it's actually true. 39.6% of boot camp graduates are women. I don't, unfortunately, I didn't have the time to compile the numbers for the United States uh, college and university market, but I feel pretty confident that it's a lot less than 40%. I feel pretty sure about that. 39.5%, so just a little bit less than that, are people of color, so people who are not white. And of course, that's not very broken down. It's not a great category, but it is useful information to just think about if we're thinking about diversity in really, really broad strokes. 87.5% had some kind of educational background, but it wasn't anything to do with computer science. So if we're thinking about the need for us to build cross-functional, collaborative teams that have skill sets that come from a wide variety of places, clearly boot camp graduates, code school graduates, are the place that we need to look for that expertise. We all know that companies, especially big tech companies in the United States, have a real problem with diversity, that there's not enough people who are not white and male with, with computer science degrees that work there. And clearly, we can see by these numbers, even though the data is not amazing, that there are plenty of people in boot camps and code schools that, that would really be beneficial for the overall tech industry. Companies need access to this diversity, and boot camps and code schools is where you can find it. This is not new necessarily information. It may be new to you, but it is publicly available. So we're still kind of sailing on smooth seas right now. But soon we will get into more information that is a little bit more murky. So let's start by thinking about what are these students learning? And it may be no surprise to you that JavaScript is eating the world. I tried to make a little joke. I'm not really very good at charts. Maybe someone wants to laugh about that. It's supposed to be Pac-Man. <laughs> 
So JavaScript rules everything around me. I don't know if you know the Wu-Tang song, but that's where that lyric comes from. Um, people are, using, are learning JavaScript. Um, people are also learning things like Ruby, Python. They're learning a little bit of data science. They're learning some UX design. And I know that these are not necessarily analogous. They're not great comparisons. But generally speaking, these are the different kinds of technologies that are being taught in coding boot camps. Probably is not necessarily that surprising. But this is where it gets super interesting that we have all of this data about the size of the market, the, the, the amount of boot camps, the, the amount of boot camps that have grown over the last couple of years. But if you ask me how these students are learning what they're learning, <laughs> I have no clue. I have no clue. I cannot tell you that. I have no, absolutely no data about what exactly it is, like how students are learning, what stacks are they learning? Are they learning Angular versus Ember versus React? Are they learning Firebase versus MongoDB versus a different kind of NoSQL database? All of that stuff is not accessible to me. So we have a, 200, we have a $210 million industry, and I have no data on like what exactly is in that big bucket of money, like how it actually comes to be. Because there's not very many standards. There's really very little information that exists that breaks it down more specifically. We don't have a lot of information about what the individual schools are teaching, because a lot of them don't make their curriculum or their syllabus public. The way that it works is that they, you sign up for their email thing, and then they already have you in like a sales loop. And then eventually, they will email you and let you know what the curriculum is. But the problem is that you're also like maybe a student and new, you're new and you don't even really know. Uh, should I be learning this? Should I be learning jQuery still? Is it gone? Is it, what about Gulp? Is that gone? OK, I don't know. Like You don't even know. You don't know enough to know when you're being sold something that ultimately isn't going to help you. You also don't know who's writing the curriculum. You also don't know what, what qualifications they need to have. Can I write JavaScript curriculum? Sure, I can. Can my dog write JavaScript curriculum? Sure, she can. That's fine. That's totally fine. There's no rules around who can just tell everybody that they're going to do this stuff. We also have no information about how students are being tested. Do they have exams? What do they look like? How are the exams different in one school versus the other one? Like, it's completely unavailable. How do we deal with cheating? We also don't know that. There's also no standards around evaluating that. What percentage of the curriculum is group work versus solo work? How do I know that student X has done the same amount of individual work as student Y? I have no information about this. I also have no information about how people are being prepared for jobs. There's some job prep. I know that. like It exists at different schools, but what it entails, I have no information. So that's a lot of stuff that we don't know. That's a lot of stuff that I don't know. That's a lot of stuff where there is just no, no data available. It just does not exist. No one is tracking it. So what we do know is very minor. There is an organization called SIR. Uh, I've put the link on there that you can check out. It's called the Council of on Integrity and Results Reporting. Basically, what that means is that they, give, they collect information about when students get hired, and what kind of jobs they get hired into, and how much money they make. You don't have to be a SIR member if you want to be a boot camp. In fact, there's like only 20 schools in there that participate. And there's over, over 100 boot camps in the United States. So that tells you that there's 80 plus who don't want to be a part of SIR. Students don't know it exists. But the biggest problem with this whole thing is that it doesn't track any information about what students are learning. It only tracks hiring data. So it can tell you how many students from school X got a job and how quickly and how much money they made. But we don't know whether or not they, they got a job based on anything that they learned. I have, for these 37,000 graduates, not a single one can I track that that person studied JavaScript at a code school and then got a JavaScript job. I can't track it. I don't have data that correlates those two. Like, what if they learned JavaScript and then they got a PHP job from something that they learned on their own before? 
I don't know. I, don't, I can't verify it. So I don't actually have any proof that anybody is actually getting hired based on the things that they are learning in code schools. Well, clearly this is a bit of a problem, right? This is, clearly there's some stuff that we should probably do about this. If we identify that hiring is about minimizing risk, right? Like I'm trying to hire somebody into a job I want to find the best possible person for the job where the chance is that they're going to screw it up or that they're not going to know what they say they know is as low as possible. But if I have no information about what that student was learning and how they were learning it and how they got tested and all this different stuff, well, it's going to be really difficult for me to be able to justify hiring that student even if they are clearly the diversity or they represent the diversity that I want in my organization. Because the big problem that code schools have is that they are not seen as a legitimate place to learn something. And I have to say, after doing all this research and learning about this, I kind of have to agree. Because clearly there's a lot of stuff here that we don't know, and there's a lot of stuff here that where we really can't tell. Students don't know whether or not they're learning something worthwhile, and employers don't know whether students are learning something worthwhile either. In order to make tech more diverse, we need to make code schools more legitimate. If we agree that code schools are where people who are people of color, who are queer people, who are women, are, are, are work, or are, that's where they're learning to code, if we agree that that's the case and that that's what the data seems to show us because that's the data we have, then the way to make tech more diverse needs to be that we make the ways that they learn more acceptable in the, in the bigger tech sphere, right? I think so. Maybe you think so as well. I think it's definitely the case. So I'm kind of an action-based person. I don't really like to feel like I don't know what to do. Um, so the next part, the next few things are basically my ideas around what we as individuals can maybe change, what we can do, but also how, and the things that we should talk to our companies about. Because left to its own devices, clearly, that's because that's what's been happening for the last eight, seven, eight years. We've left the boot camp industry, at least in the United States, to its own devices, and they have no interest in changing, no interest in being more transparent, no interest in being more accountable, because it works really well for those organizations that really don't have a student's best interest at heart. If you're a legitimate organization and you send your data to SIR and you really want a great school and you are invested in teaching people well, and those schools definitely exist. For example, my former employer is somebody who's very transparent. They are part of the, the part of one of the boot camps that started SIR and all that different stuff. I feel very pleased and very proud about that. But there are many places, all they see is opportunity to make a bunch of money. And so it doesn't really seem like they want to change. So what can we do? That's always what I want to ask, is what can we do? Well, on an individual basis, there's actually quite a few things that you can do. You can, for example, approach a code school that you're interested in, in, in supporting, a local one maybe, or even you could even do it by the internet, and you can basically ask them questions. You can say, who writes your curriculum? What, what is that background? What do they do? Oh, you don't have anybody who advises your curriculum? Okay, well, I would, I would, I'm a developer at XYZ. I would be happy to share my experience and my advice um, on what you're, what you're doing. And in some cases, they might not be interested, and they might be like, nah, we do our own thing, we don't care. But if it's a good code school, then they should really want, they should really want to hear from you. They should really want your input. Another thing that you can do is that you can mentor individual students. If you have a little bit of experience under your belt and you have been coding or working in the tech field for a little while and you care about this stuff, you care about diversity, you care about people getting an opportunity, see if there's somebody that you can do some outreach to. Like, it doesn't have to be in person. You can find them on Twitter, you can put something out there and you could say, hey, you're applying to a code school, I'm happy to talk with you about what I, think you, what I think you should be learning. I'm happy to talk to you about what you should be emphasizing. If you have a blog or you have a, a resource, you have somebody makes an awesome video or somebody some, does something, share that information, share it out widely. Don't assume that people are already going to know because they won't. 
like even tutorials, even for simple things, like maybe just like getting started with Git, I don't know, whatever. Getting that resources out there and giving people the t different tools is something that you can do as an individual. It's not going to affect things systemically, but it will help. But more what you can do is inside of your company, you can become a champion for code school graduates. You can talk on Slack or in your hiring meeting about how important it is that we hire people from different, different skin colors, different genders, but also from different educational backgrounds. You can, you can do that. You can become that champion. You can do it in person at your company. You can do it on Twitter. You can do it wherever you can. And it might not always be appropriate, but you can, in some cases, also call out schools that seem to have dubious standards and that seem to be just kind of like in it for the money. You can tweet them. You can, you can ask them questions. You can send them emails. You can let them know that somebody's noticing and paying attention to what they're doing. It's not always appropriate, but it might be sometimes appropriate. What can companies do? Companies can do a lot. Uh, they have a lot of resources. They have the ability to really shape the game. After all, code schools are dependent on companies because that's where the hiring happens, right? So companies can work with students and graduates in a different way. They can create internship programs. They can create apprenticeship programs, which is something that's been happening a lot more in the United States, where you work with, you work with somebody who's very junior for a longer period of time, six months, maybe eight months, and you teach them the skills that they need to know. You can, as a company, encourage your employees to mentor. A lot of companies in the United States have volunteer opportunities. They encourage their employees to volunteer. Well, why don't you also encourage your employees to mentor upcoming junior, junior, uh, junior devs, code school students, self-taught developers? Why are you not doing that? There's so many of them. Like, like, why are you sending people to pick up trash on the beach when you could actually be working in your own tech community and doing something actual, real for diversity? Meetups, conferences like this one, there's a lot of money invested in, this, in these kinds of events, which is amazing. But the, we know now that the market of graduates is so big, why are we not organizing things that are specifically for people who come from code schools? Why is that not happening? There's so many. Why is it not happening? I don't know, but it should. And companies can put the screws on, can put the pressure on schools to deliver in-depth data and reporting. Code schools clearly won't do it without a little bit of pressure, unless it's the folks who are, actually have good intentions, which there are, totally exist. But companies have the ability to say, you know what, we're actually not going to hire graduates from you if you don't give us a little bit more information about what you're teaching and how you're teaching it. And you can cre you have companies can create official partnerships between them as a company and them as a school. Because basically what I believe is that education and hiring are completely separate. And until we close the loop a little bit more and make these things more interconnected, it's going to be very difficult for us to create change. Another idea that I have that hasn't happened yet and that I would really love to see, I would really love to see a large tech company take on the challenge of creating its own educational institution inside of the company. I love this idea because it allow, would allow them to provide opportunity to underrepresented people, while at the same time, it would also allow the company to profit and do well by hiring the best people in that cohort, in that class. We know already that there's so many students. It's a gold mine. Why hasn't anybody done this yet? You should do it, and then you should hire me or, or something. Consult with me, and I will be happy to advise you on this. If you did something like that, you would provide this effect of legitimizing those folks who are studying with you. Because I can't imagine that, let's just say, Google started a code school that anybody would say, well, I'm not quite sure their curriculum is going to be relevant. I don't know if that's legit or not, you know? That's not going to happen because of the fact that they can legitimize these kinds of things. And it gives an opportunity to model the future and really change the industry from the ground up. Because the problem with diversity initiatives that are happening right now, millions and millions of dollars are getting thrown into hiring people, but they kick in too late. We need, to, we need to start sooner. We need to start before people are being ready to hire. 
We need to start earlier and like affect them in that way. And I believe that we could really make a lot of positive change happen. Clearly, tech education isn't going away. Clearly, the market shows, even though it's changing, even though it's maturing, even though some things are working and some things are not, clearly it's not going away. I think that we can assume that code schools and boot camps are going to stick around for quite some time to come. And that's actually fine. I am not, in, I am not criticizing the existence of for-profit education. I'm not criticizing boot camps and code school as a whole. The only thing I am critiquing is shady reporting or non-reporting. The things I'm critiquing are a lack of accountability, not the existence of, of these schools in and, of whole, uh, in and of themselves. The amazing thing about code schools is that they do have the flexibility to keep pace with new technologies that emerge. And they do have the ability to, to move very quickly, and they do have the ability to really reach people who can't afford to attend, either with their time or with their money, to attend like a full academic curriculum, which, as you probably all are aware, in the United States is extremely expensive. And it's also not easy in other countries as well. So it's not going away, and it shouldn't, but it does need to change. And it does need to mature. I think it needs to grow. I think there's enormous potential there that has not even been realized. And I love, to, I love it. I love teaching. I love working with students, even though I don't do it more, anymore professionally. I'm still very much involved in creating learning opportunities. I think if you wanted to summarize my talk, it would be that I feel like you all and I will continue to support students, future students, current students, recent graduates, we need to participate in building relevant, using, useful things that people are actually using nowadays curriculum. I saw one code school where I, I, I asked them to send me their syllabus, and they did. And they called the class full stack JavaScript. And it was HTML, CSS, and jQuery. And then they're wondering that people won't get a job. And they were charging something like $12,000 for that. Why? It's not OK. I think we need to hold, co co hold code schools more accountable to deliver information about what they're teaching and how, so that things like that don't happen. And I think that one way we can do that is that we can start having conversations with our employers. We can start having conversations with the companies that fund, that fund these amazing events that we attend, that fund opportunities for us, and that we know need to change in terms of who they hire. We can make tech more diverse, more diverse, and more inclusive, and more accessible. But it's going to make it's going to involve all of us working together to make that happen. Thanks. Thank you for this great talk. We have time for a few questions. I can't see anybody because the lights are really bright. So. Is there anyone yes. there? I see you with the red sweatshirt, maybe. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to point. Uh, hi, I just wanted to point to an initiative in Switzerland. It's called Power Coders. And great. That's a, a coding academy specifically specifically for refugees. Awesome! I love that idea. And the way it works is, um, you have companies that would hire sort of these refugees, and they will go to um, coding school. And after coding school, after these uh, three or four months, they would start an internship, and they get, a, get, they get a salary and everything. Right. And it's an initiative that's, that comes from um, l a few large Swiss agencies and has been backed now by the Swiss government and Adobe, and it's really gaining momentum, and yeah. this gives it this... Um, I love that idea. Can you, can you repeat what it's called again? It's called Power Coders. Okay, pa Power, Power, Coders, Power Coders. PowerCoders.org. Okay, I will look that up. That sounds really phenomenal. I yes. would love to yeah. interrogate that a little bit more and learn a little bit more yeah. deeply about what that involves, because that sounds really, yeah. really uh, like a great way to... A great way to make some change happen, make a difference. Yeah. Can yeah. I ask you a question also? 
Yes. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, do you know of any initiative to sort of standardize curriculums or have like this, I don't. this, uh, this no. accountability? I don't. Doesn't as far as I know, none exists. Oh. The okay. only thing exists is, this, is, is the SIR, which is just about hiring and outcomes. And that's the only, that's the only thing that I know that exists. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, thanks for the talk. It was yeah, really you're welcome. Inspiring. I, really, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> and my question is, so you can develop these abilities in every, every, every country, but how, I mean, with this cold school, sure, but how this matches the, the, the necessity of the companies? Because in, in a lot of countries when you can have these cold schools, right. in some school, they, I mean, they don't even, they don't, they're not even, uh, ready for having these people there. So why would you, why would you like, um, have these abilities in, this, in these students? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Could you rephrase it a different okay. way? Okay. So, um, so cold schools would go to any country. Uh, you can right. have this cold school in any country. Let's say I come from Latin America, so right. we might have a few there, but why would you need these people in these countries looking for diversity, of course, if the the industry is not even ready for this, uh, for this kind of abilities in, in the people. Yeah. So even if, of course, we want diversity and we want people from every every part of the world, but yeah, uh, sometimes it doesn't match. It doesn't match what what it's needed. Right. Well, that's where I think that it needs to be a closer partnership between the people who are running the schools and the companies that are hiring locally. So that's basically kind of like my overarching idea is I think that there needs to be a closer connection between the two so that you're not teaching things that aren't being useful or you're not using technologies or approaches that are not actually being used. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but those are my thoughts. So I uh, only got, got like the second half of your talk, but okay. uh, it was great. I think so, it's being recorded. <laughs> you can yeah, watch it again. I'll go watch it. Uh, so you also talked about internships. And yeah. One question that I have is that what do you think of companies setting fixed age frames for internships? So for example, uh, uh -huh. companies that require you to be enrolled in a university program to be able to even apply for internships. Yeah. I think that is quite unfair, both against people who, like me, are still in right. high school and right. people who uh, don't attend the university right. and then have no alternative than to go to a cold school. Yes. I think that that's, I think that that is, I would love to know more about what their reasons are for doing that. I think that that sounds a little bit problematic to me. Um, generally speaking, there are some exceptions, but the majority of people that I worked with um, were between 25 and 35 in the United States. I had, I had people as young as 17, 18, and I had people as old as 60, 63. Who were learning how to who were learning how to to program, and I think that just creating a really specific age set that doesn't sound very flexible to me, and I think that it might not necessarily be ideal if what you're trying to do is to appeal to people who might not otherwise pursue that career. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so I'm not. Thanks. So I would love to. I would love to understand more about what their motivations were. Maybe I'm missing something, but I don't think that that sounds like a great idea personally. Okay, thank with you. the limited information that I have. Yeah. I think there's somebody here. Thanks for doing all the running around, Helmut. Hi. Hi. Uh, I would like to know if you think there are things that a mentor needs to do differently for a mentee that's coming from a code school as compared uh -huh. to maybe a student. Sure. I because think that there are. I think they probably have less of a theoretical background. So yes. maybe. I need to teach them different things than I need to teach someone who's from university. Right. Um, I, think that, I think that your intuition is good. I think that in many cases, the, what I see is that people who, uh, let me start differently. I have had um, code school students who did a computer science degree first and then actually came to code school afterwards because they said, well, I know all the theory, but I don't really understand how to actually build an application. So, and I think that that, that, uh, that split still is, is, holds true, that you're going to learn more, more theory in a computer science degree than you will in an accelerated program that's mostly focused on, on uh, learning the hands-on nuts and bolts of, 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 of building 
building a thing. So I think if what you're trying to do is you're trying to mentor, which I, 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 I applaud you for doing, I, I'm proud of you, um, is that yes, I think that making sure that if, a, if somebody is interested in a theory, you don't necessarily always need to know, depending on what you want to do, um, you might not need to know that much theory, but if a student is, if somebody is interested in that, then I think tr trying to find them resources or supporting them in finding resources or talking through concepts with them that are more theoretical in nature is, 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 a, good, is a good way forward. Um, I think that w the, the thing that, that code school students often uh, they, they, they struggle with not even knowing that things are a thing. They're like, you tell them, oh, well, have you heard of big O notation? And they're like, uh, no, because they don't know. And so it's like you almost have to give them more stuff to look up because they don't actually know that things already exist. And they come up with a way of doing something that's a great solution to a problem. And then afterwards, you tell them, well, that's actually this, this, this software design pattern. And you actually just coincidentally did that. But they don't know the things, the names of things to research. So I think, I think giving them more theory is good, but also just like giving them a bunch of names of things to look up is also, is also sometimes useful. Yeah, thank you. How much time do we have? I don't. Yeah, I just wanted to say maybe just only one keep... question. Can... Okay, I'm just going to keep talking until somebody tells I me to not. I will just be really quick. How this case applies to Europe, especially in Germany, where, for example, elite university are for free, like TUM. Yeah. So each person can actually go to university, and they're supported yes. by the state. Yeah. So we don't have boot camp, or it's yeah. not a big scene. Yeah. In Germany. Um, what, so, the, so the question is how you feel like it, uh, how I feel like it applies. Yeah, th that's the thing. Is I think that I, th I believe that there are um, some boot camps in, in 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 Germany, even if there's not as many, because of the, the educational system is is in, indeed different. Um, I think that it's still interesting to see because I believe that the same problems might come up. Let's just say you got a computer science degree at the university. Um, good for you. Maybe you need to learn a specific skill that wasn't taught at your university. Those kinds of extension classes also exist, I think. And if that's not done uh, thoughtfully, then again, you will run into the same problem that uh, maybe you're learning things that you don't really need. Or the way that the classes are being organized is not necessarily with the student's best interests at heart, and it's mostly for making money. But it does vary a bit depending on where you are. Um, I was talking to some people who um, attended code schools in Eastern Europe, and they say that a lot of the problems that I was describing uh, uh, exist in those spaces as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.